Welcome to the LHA Church Podcast. This is Jerry Galloway, and I'm the pastor of LHA Church. Thanks for joining us today. I pray this blesses you, strengthens your faith to know that God is working in your life. Enjoy the message. This morning, we are so honored to have David and Donna Delp with us today in the house of the Lord. And they're going to be coming in a few moments, and they're going to be sharing with us today. Before they do, uh, I mentioned to you just a couple of weeks ago that we'd had the opportunity to come along beside Russ and Sarah Farhood, who are our missionaries in Equatorial Guinea. We have the opportunity to, to partner with them to build uh, a sanctuary building put up to provide the steel structure uh, for that sanctuary building. Today, um, this is the check that's going to pay for that sanctuary. And before we mail it out, amen, amen, amen. It has been through, of course, God's faithfulness. But I would say to you, it is because you have caught the vision of missions and reaching the world. It is through your giving to missions that above supporting our missionaries this year, just this year alone, we've been able to do this and provide this sanctuary. And so before we send it out, I, I want this to be the most anointed check that's ever went through the mail. This will be a prophetic check. This check is planting seed today for people you and I don't know, we've never seen that are going to come and find Jesus as Savior and Lord. Out of that church, God's going to raise up more leaders, more pastors, more teachers, more evangelists. They're going to go and they're going to spread the gospel. And more 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 are going to come into the kingdom of God because the seed was planted by some people in Grant County, Indiana. And the seed is going to continue to blossom and grow as we see God move. I've asked David. David is going to be sharing more with us this morning of the vision. They are going to be going to Africa and doing incredible things for God. I've asked him today if he would lead us in prayer. And what I'd like, I'd like for 15 or 20 of you, 20 of you to come uh, and stand here with me uh, as we just place our hands on this check. And so 15 or 20 of you, would you just come now? And uh, we're going to pray as this thing goes out in the mail. This could be a prophetic thing. The seed sown here is going to reap an incredible harvest for the kingdom of God. Amen. You know, as we, as we prepare to pray, I'll be telling a story later on about a tabernacle. Don and I have been in these tabernacles. I want you to understand what you've done. Because Africa is such a huge continent, 1.3 billion people. You can fit the United States of America, China, India, France, England, Italy, and a bunch of other small countries on the land mass. And today, if you think about what would it be like if the nearest church was in Pennsylvania or Missouri. It's okay. That's the reality, folks. But it wouldn't matter much to you because you'd never heard the name of Jesus anyway. Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh, God. We are all about you being known, Lord, in all the earth, in every place. Father, we have a dream that in Africa that there would be a church within walking distance of every person on that continent. And sometimes it seems so far away, but Lord, today, today there's going to be a shack that's coming down because of this check. Oh, God, we pray that not only the finances of this church would be sown into this tabernacle, but the hearts of Lighthouse Assembly would be sown into a part of Africa 
Lord, where you're doing something. And there would be a place, there would be a place where your people can come and they can gather and it can be a lighthouse to that community in Africa for the touching of people's lives. And Father, exactly, you know exactly where this church is going up. And we pray that you prepare the soil and prepare the hearts and prepare the church, Lord, that they may see greater things than they ever thought possible, that things that they could not do on their own are happening. Because, Lord, there is a group of people that's been praying, God, if you would just help us get this done. And today, this church is an answer, a prayer to that church on the other side of the globe. Your anointing, your presence, your peace, your power go with these finances. That the glory of God would be revealed in the hearts of people that would not have known. And God, to you we give all glory and honor and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. One more. <laughs> One more. One more. One more, Lord. One more. Lord, bring the increase. Bring the increase, Lord. Bring the increase. Thank you, Jesus. The late Reinhard Bonnke said the call of the church is to plunder hell and populate heaven. That's what this is about. <laughs> One day you and I are going to make it to heaven. When we get there, there's going to be people that are going to be there because you gave. And there was a place that people could come and hear the gospel. As I told you earlier, David and Donna, they are true servants of the kingdom. They are authentic believers. A man and a woman who have walked not always an easy journey, but they've walked a journey with the Father. And the Father's been with them through many tests and trials, we have already come. But his grace sustains us through them all. And he will continue to be faithful. Father, today as David and Adana are here, I pray, Father, your hand of anointing and blessing upon them today. Oh, Heavenly Father, we welcome you, Holy Spirit, right now into this time. Holy Spirit, speak to us what's on the heart and the mind of the Father for today. For these people specific to this day. Have your way, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Titus, if you help us with a video this morning. Well, Donna and I both have spent more than the last three decades in ministry. I've been with the Indiana Assemblies of God for over 20 years, and I've poured into pastors for years. That's been my role in my job, just helping them be healthy and effective in the harvest. I've been in ministry for over 30 years. I was raised in a pastor's home, and I served in the ministry with my husband for several years before we became missionaries with Convoy of Hope Europe. It was there that I also served as the children's pastor at International Christian Center in Brussels, Belgium. Later, my husband and I transitioned to the U.S. State Department Foreign Service where we served in South Africa and in Nigeria. Six years ago, before Donna and I even knew one another, 
our lives were forever changed through separate tragedies. That for me, after over 33 years of marriage and loving one another, raising a family and constantly serving together in ministry and in life, my wife Joyce went to bed on a Friday night and she had a headache and the next morning I couldn't wake her up. And several hours later, as the day progressed, my daughters and I stood in the hallway of a critical care unit and we made the decision to disconnect her from life support and I will never forget that moment. I will never forget that room. That we prayed and we trusted God, but within minutes, Joyce was in the presence of Jesus. We simply could not believe what had happened. I came back home late that evening to just an empty and devastated world. While I was living in Lagos, Nigeria, Dave and I went with a group of people. It was a beautiful day to a small island near Lagos. Life in the city was crowded and it could be really difficult, so we were so looking forward to a day away from all of the chaos. Dave and I made our way down to the beach and I got in and waited only knee deep, but the water was rough and an unexpected wave hit me and pulled me into a series of three riptides I couldn't get out. Dave came for me and he bought me a little bit of time, but he then became caught himself. If it wasn't for a trained sailor and a Marine who happened to be on the beach with us that day, I would have died. They came to me first and rescued me and then they went in for Dave, but it took too long and it was too late. My daughter and I sat on the beach and we watched him, we prayed, and we watched him die and it was over. 30 years of marriage were just ended in a moment's time. And a few weeks later, I went back to that very spot and I scattered and I sowed Dave's ashes in the water and in the soil of Africa. For Donna and I, after we faced the tragedies in our lives, our journeys were similar. The questioning and the confusion, the shattered remnants of a life that was just blown up and scattered. Nearly two years after those events, we met and God put us together and the trajectory of our grief did not just instantly change in that moment. The, the pain didn't immediately go away, but we were healing. We got married and we faced challenges of merging two lives and two families and all of the pain and the hurt that still needed to be healed. The things that had happened to us were beyond our understanding, but God, He lovingly led us through all the pain and the anger and confusion, and He gradually brought us to a place of deep trust and faith. We could have never connected all of those dots on our own, but God has taken what He's sown into both of our lives. He called us, asked us to leave a secure future and influential ministry, and to invest our future in Africa. That which has happened to us has really served to advance the gospel of Christ. Good morning. Thank you for the song. It was amazing. It was amazing, and I do feel that way. I want you to know the video, the little girl that you saw, um, not my baby. <laughs> She's our granddaughter, Eloise, and she was born just about one month after my husband passed away. That, uh, and, we, and, and we, have, we have, between the two of us, we have six children, um, four of them are married, we have three grandchildren, and they're spread all over the world, and we are so incredibly grateful. We really, really are for the blessings of God and his faithfulness, because it's true all of our, my life, he has been faithful. I have to tell you, though, that I, I really didn't always feel that way, and maybe that comes as a shock to you. I'm a, I'm a preacher's kid. I was practically born in the front pew of a church. I should know better, right? But I can tell you that that day that I walked away from the beach and that picture that you saw of me spreading the ashes at the beach was the exact spot where my husband died, where I sat there and watched him die. And we had his body cremated because to get a body from Nigeria to the States, just let me tell you, it was just more than what I could do. 
So that's what we did. And I walked away that day wondering what it was that I believed about the faithfulness of God. In fact, I asked him, I said, God, you know, if I'm going to pray and you just do whatever you want to do anyway, I was a little angry. (laughs) Then why do I pray? It's an honest question that I had for God. I didn't understand because I felt like it didn't matter that day that I had prayed. And I asked him, I said, God, what difference does it make? He says, Donna, you act like you have no hope. And that song this morning, out of the ashes, hope will arise. And I have to tell you, it is so true. And what I had to learn was, is I had to get my eyes off of the stuff that I did not understand. And I had to look up and give God the glory and the honor and the praise that he was due. Because there's always going to be stuff that's going on in your life. Things that have happened that you do not understand. But let me tell you... (laughs) Don't let it contaminate your trust in God. Because God is always trustworthy. And if you keep looking up and you keep your eyes on him, he is always faithful and he will be faithful. And I know that there are some of you here today, there is stuff that's happened in your life that you do not understand. And today is for you. Because God has a plan and he has a purpose. And let me tell you one more thing that I don't think that I I very, very rarely share. But it was a moment in my life that it was the darkest time that, that, that I had. And I told God, I said, look, if you are paying attention to me anymore, I need to know it's before I met David. And I told God what I was going to do. And I said, if you're paying attention, you stop me. And I got a private Facebook message from this man right here that said that he had been thinking about me and God had laid him on my heart and he was praying for me. And God asked me that question. He says, Donna, you want to do it my way or you want to do it your way? And I'm thankful that he's paying attention and God is paying attention to you this morning and he is always faithful. You know, I'm just uh wow the presence of god is strong in this place i'm a little bit messed up this morning you know the video that you that you saw cameroon the really big white guy the missionary ben dunlap um he's a friend and we leave tomorrow we leave tomorrow morning for africa We're going to be there about 10 days, and Ben and Michelle will be with us as we are working with our leaders on the continent. And I am so, I, we feel so blessed to have the opportunity to pour into our missionary leadership on that continent, to go and live with them and be with them. Um. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing there, but God has put a message on my heart that has more to do with you than it does with us, and I want to encourage you in that, and if you want to look in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, I'll start there in just a moment, but one of the the cities where we need to plant an urban church is Douala, Cameroon, there where Ben and Michelle live. And I tell you, you know, to go back to the tabernacle thing, and just there has been such a foundation laid in so many places in Africa, the gospel, the church of Jesus Christ is so strong in so many places. And I could tell you stories of how the national church is very strong, and the national church is sending missionaries and the national church is multiplying. Yet so many places where there is so much work to still be done. And I talked to a pastor the other day, um, far away from here in another, another state. We're going to go and be with them in a few weeks for their missions conference. And he said to me, you know, the younger people in our church want to invest all in our city. They don't want to invest across the ocean. 
And I understand that because the mandate God has given us is Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so God is concerned about all the world. He's concerned about all the world. He's concerned about Gas City and Marion and Indiana and the United States of America where I've invested my ministry for the past over 30 years in Indiana and the United States of America. And God saw fit to expand our borders, and I may tell you a little bit about that, but I want to thank you for having a vision for the world. I told you I was messed up, okay, already. Thanks for having a vision for the world because I care about this city. God cares about this city. I care about this state and this country very much. And we've got a lot of work to do here. But it has become something that God has led us to, to be concerned about such large places where there's no witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That 240 million people, 240 million, which is what about two-thirds the size of all of the people in the United States, but 230, 240 million people have no access to the gospel. See, I don't like throwing numbers around because it starts to boggle our minds and we don't really absorb it, but of the one point three billion people in Africa, over one billion people in Africa, 800 million of them don't know Christ. But 240 million of them don't have access. They're part of an unreached people group. They live in a place where not only are there no churches, but there are no believers. They don't know one person in their life who can even tell them, about Jesus. And while I've invested the last 30 years of my life in Indiana, I'm reminded that we have 230 Assemblies of God churches in Indiana. Most places in Indiana have an Assembly of God church, not all. We still need to plant churches here. Six million people in Indiana. Now I think the, of the and I'm not, not comparing, but I'm just telling you that this is the heart of God. I think of the 8 million people in the Johannesburg, Johannesburg Metroplex, just in that one city, and the massive cities of Africa. And I'm starting off today differently than I normally do, but I want to encourage you in what you have done and what you are doing because this church does have a heart for that, for both this community and to the uttermost, to the ends of the earth. And I encourage you to continue to do the work of the gospel. I'm going to take things out of sequence because I want to tell you this. I laid in bed one night. I'm just on a different track but um, than normal. But I laid in bed one night as God was calling us to Africa. And I said, God, I'm okay with whatever you tell me to do because I've always said to God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. And most of all, I'll be who you want me to be. And so with this, I, we yielded. I said, God, I am, we will completely yield to this call. But I just got to know one thing. Why Africa? You ever ask a question like that? God, I'm good with whatever you tell me, but why Africa? Because I could keep doing what I'm doing and what I have been doing, and I could find places to do that just right down the street, and the work would never seem to be done. So why Africa? And here's what God said to me in one of those moments that I'll never forget. He said two things to me. One is, he said, first of all, son, this was in the middle of the night. He said, when you think of the globe... People have drawn lines on the globe, and they've called them countries, and they've written names on maps, naming certain pieces of land certain things, like 
the United States of America, Indiana, Namibia, South Africa, Nigeria, China. And while there is validity to the fact that I believe that there are powers and principalities and I believe that there are regions that are identified in the heavenlies, what God said to my heart that night was, Son, the whole earth is mine. And it's my heart that the glory of God would cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. And all of the people on the earth, I care about them and I love them. And if it would be in my determination that what I have invested in your life over the past 30 or 40 years, that I can best invest that in Africa, then my question to you is, why not? And I said, that's fair enough. <laughs> and then you know how God always goes one step further. And he gives us value at it all the time. And I could hear the Holy Spirit saying to me, and besides that, as you walk the dusty roads of Africa and through the crowded cities of Africa, you will come to know me in a way that you could not have known me in a way that you have not known me before. And it was in that moment that I just latched on because, folks, when we walk in obedience to God and we walk in the good places the easy places, the hard places, wherever we walk, when you walk the path that God has laid out for you, He reveals Himself to you in ways that you cannot even fathom. When we respond to the heart of God, whether it be a tabernacle in Cameroon or it be sharing Christ with someone in the coffee shop downtown, when we bless the heart of God through obedience, He reveals Himself to us in ways that we could not have known Him before. Is anybody else as excited about that as I am? And when God asks you to give or God asks you to trust and you do it, He reveals Himself to you in ways that you could not even have imagined that He ever could. Jeremy, I'm proud of you, buddy. Some through the fire and some through the flood. Some through great sorrow, but all through the blood. You know? John, come up here. I'm going to pull a pastor down. I always watch him do this, you know. I'm going to do this. Come up here, John. You know, 30 years ago, this doesn't have anything much to do with the message, but 30 years ago or more, I was a group leader at boys' camp. And when the boys arrived, I found that John Buckler was a little boy, and he was in my room. You remember that, John? And we spent a week together. That's back in the days when I think the group leader was in the room with the boys, you know. And so John and I spent a week at Lake Placid at boys' camp one summer a long time ago. That was a long time ago. John, I'm proud of you because you're still serving Jesus. A lifetime right there, buddy. Love you. <laughs> See, folks, it's such a joy to serve God because he does so many things in our lives. And when you get to heaven, when you get to heaven, see, I'm, I'm backloading this message, but when you get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of people that's going to want to hug your neck. And you're going to wonder what on earth is the connection. And they're going to tell you what the connection is. And many of them will be there because of you. Mostly because of Jesus, but because God worked in you in your obedience. And after you enjoy meeting a bunch of people like that, you're going to look for Pastor Jerry and Paula. You're going to look for Pastor Jeremy. And you're going to look for other leaders in this church. And you're going to say, thanks for taking up all those offerings. Thanks for challenging us to do stuff to advance the kingdom of God. Why didn't you do more? You should have took up more offerings. That's what's going to happen. Do you believe that? 
that is exactly what's going to happen because what farmer sows half of his field trying to save seed and then when harvest comes in, he's thinking, well, I'm glad I saved all that seed in the barn. He's thinking, man, I should have planted the rest of this field. This is a good harvest, so I encourage you in that, folks. Well, that's part of the message that I was going to preach. Now, let me go back to the beginning of it <laughs> and fill in the blanks, all right? In Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, Apostle Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel. Now note, first of all, he's not in prison for doing bad things, for killing somebody, for stealing something. He's in prison for preaching the gospel of Christ. In our estimation, an admirable thing to do. And sometimes, folks, we do all the right things and we still end up in prison or we still end up persecuted or we still end up suffering a bit. But see, the measure of whether or not you're doing the right thing is not in what you experience. Hey, this is good. I hope that Donna writes this down. <laughs> the measure of whether or not you're doing what you should do is not in the experiences that you have, but it's in whether or not you have been obedient to what God has asked you to do. And so this is Paul's situation, and he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. I want to focus on that verse 12 where Apostle says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. The reason Donna and I are still telling our story and the reason we put it on video is because we can tell it faster and we don't have to personally tell it again. But the reason that we're still telling this story is it is integrated in the reason that we are going to Africa and some of you have been through worse things. Some of you maybe not such bad things. But there are still things that have happened in your life. There are things that have happened in your life that when submitted to Christ, He is able to return beauty for the ashes of the things that have happened. And you know what I love about old saints? is if you sit down with them and they start telling you the stories, you hear that arise. This is the faithfulness of God. He has been faithful all the way. He has blessed my life. And you know what? It's like we develop a selective memory. <laughs> we begin to focus on what God has truly done in our lives. And so, folks, there are the difficulties in our lives the hard things in our lives, the things that have happened in our lives. And then there are the good things that have happened. I mean, this church is building a tabernacle. Is it in Cameroon or in Equatorial? Okay, it's in Equatorial. See, you're building a tabernacle there. But the good thing that you held in your hands was the finances that you could give to that. See? And so God blessed you so that you could participate in his work in a unique way. So there's the tough stuff that's happened, and then there's the blessings and the skills and the resources. For Donna and I, there are things that we have learned along the way as we prepared ourselves to minister to leaders and churches. We learned things along the way, and one day God popped up and said, you know, this is really cool, except I kind of need that skill set in Africa. Well, okay then. If you ever, when I was in Bible college, we used to tease one another. You know, it's kind of like we'd yell with a deep voice down the HVAC vents, go to Africa. <laughs> the guys in the room downstairs, stop it. 
And yet here we are. But in Exodus chapter 3 and 4, Moses is on the backside of the wilderness. Right? And see, God has purposed that Moses is going to be the deliverer of the people of Israel empowered by God. And yet he is messed up again and again. And for 40 years, he has been tending sheep in the desert. And one day, 40 years into this, he looks up and he sees a bush that's burning and it's not being consumed. Hmm, that's really odd. God got his attention. You can go to the backside of the desert, but God has a way of getting our attention through the circumstances of our lives. So he goes to see what is this burning bush. And when he nears it, he hears a voice saying, Moses, take your shoes off because this is holy ground. Moses took his shoes off and he approached the bush and the presence of God was in this bush. And God began to speak to Moses. Moses, I'm calling you to be the deliverer of my people. You're going to go to Egypt. You're going to tell the Pharaoh to let my one million people go. And you're going to walk out of there with them. I can't do that, Moses says. I can't even string together a sentence. You expect me to do that? I can't do that. I don't have the skills to do that. I can't do that. And God asked Moses a question. It's the same question that he's asking you and I today. And that is, Moses, what's in your hand? It was a shepherd's rod. What's in your hand? Is it the difficulties? Is it the terrible things that have, that which has happened to me? is in this hand. The skills, the blessings, and what God has gifted you to do is in this hand. And some of you are saying, I haven't been gifted to do anything. That's a lie from the devil. Every one of you, God has uniquely crafted and breathed things into your life that will contribute to the advance of the gospel. Every single one of you. But here's the key to finding it out. Hallelujah. He says, what's in your hand? A shepherd's rod. God says, lay what's in your hand down in front of me. Give me what's in your hand. Give me that which has happened to you. For some of you, it's stuff that happened 40 years ago. For some of you, it's stuff you're walking through right now. But he's saying, what's in your hand? Lay it down before me. And then there's the blessings and the finances and the resources and the skill sets. And God is saying, what's in your hand? And then he's saying, lay it down before me. And we lay that old spindly rod down before God that we just picked up somewhere along the way. And we lay that down before God. And what happened? It turned into a snake. And Moses ran away because it was a dangerous snake. See, when God begins his work of transformation, it sometimes scares us. For us, it was Africa. What is it for you? That when you lay it down before God and you start to realize this is going to cost more than I wanted it to cost, you lay it down before God and it scares you a little bit. But God says to Moses, come on back and I want you to pick up that snake by the tail. All right, now this is another point. I grew up in southern West Virginia, and you never pick up a snake by its tail, let alone one that's pison. Them snakes is pison. Never done that before. See, we were, we were in the Appalachian District where I grew up. Donna was with me, and we were touring the district, and you know, the places, and my dialect started coming back. My um, accent, um, colloquialism started coming back, and she's like, what are you talking about? Who are you, and what happened to the guy I'm married to? I couldn't help it. But anyway... He reached down and he took a hold of that snake by the tail. Now, what does this mean? It means that when you lay it down before God, the way that he puts it back in your hand isn't always the way you expect. See, we got to be willing to let God be God and move in the circumstance and say, 
Now, I ain't going to pick up that thing by the tail. You got to walk with God. He reached down and got a hold of that snake by the tail. He picked it up, and it turned back into the rod. And God said, Moses, this is how we're going to do it. You just lay down whatever it is in your hand in front of me, and I'm going to do whatever only I can do. And then with obedience, I want you to take it back and do with it what I tell you to do exactly what I tell you to do with it. Man, you guys messed me up this morning, the whole thing. But I want you to know, every person in this sanctuary has stuff in your hands. And when you lay it down before God, he does awesome things. I've changed her name because it's just easier. That way I don't have to ask if the service is being streamed. Changed her name to Tomby. Tomby was a little lady. She is a little lady. In a village in Africa of about 700 people that's inaccessible by automobile. By the way, Anybody here ever give to speed the light? I saw one in 5,000 shirt down here. We're on the list for a $45,000 vehicle. Don't ask me why it's so much. I don't know. That's just what they put on the list. But it's because we got to get places that cars won't go, see? Got to have some four-wheel drive going. I want one of those snorkels. It's an add-on, you know. I want one of those snorkels, and I want a bush guard. We're going to be in the cities a lot, but I still want a snorkel and a bush guard. They probably won't give me one. But, you know, she lived in a village of 700 people, inaccessible by automobile, and she became lame, unable to really walk, she was a single mom, a little girl, I believe that it is, and her husband left her. He's gone. With no means of really supporting themselves, she went to the city, Maputo. She goes to Maputo to build a life, to look for work, to somehow piece things together. And when she was in Maputo, she became connected with some people. And she became a part of an Assembly of God church in the city of Maputo. Tombe came to Christ. She began to know Christ in incredible ways. Her life was transformed. She was so moved by Jesus. And as she continued to grow in the faith, God began to put it upon her heart that she would go back to her village as a missionary. See, this is the win, folks. We plant churches in the cities, and that's one of the chief things that Don and I will be doing. We'll be training our missionary teams. We'll be raising up leaders. We'll be planting churches in the gateway cities of Africa with teams that are raised up to go in and supporting those church planters in those cities. But see, the reason it's so important to have a church in the city is because Africa is urbanizing faster than any other place on the planet. By 2030, Africa will be 60% urbanized. The people are moving into the cities, not just from their own country, but the countries all across Africa. They are migrating to the largest cities on the continent. and became to know Christ. A passion, fervent for missions rose up in her heart and she decided that she would go back to the village that she came from. The unreached people, 700 people in that village, none of them know Jesus as Lord and Savior. She goes back into that village and she decides, I'm going to tell everybody here about Jesus. Now, in case you haven't connected the dots, if in any way, shape, or form we say, God, I can't do anything for you. Yeah, well, you can actually. She decided to tell the entire village about Jesus. 
She went to the first door. She knocked on the door. The door opened. She began to tell them about Jesus. They slammed the door in her face. They didn't want to hear about it. She went to the next house, and the same thing happened. The next house, the next house, day after day, week after week, month after month. She had been at it for one year, and not one person had come to Christ. Not one person responded favorably. So she sat down under a tree near the center of the village, and there were some children playing. <laughs> Jerry, I get to go to Africa, man. I get to go. I get to go. She began to tell the children about Jesus. She told them Bible stories of Jonah and the whale and Daniel in the lion's den and Jesus walking on the water. And the children loved the stories. They said, oh, Miss Tomby, tell us more stories. She said, I will, but your friends, they will want to hear the stories too. Go get them and I'll tell you more stories. This went on for a little while, and most of the children in the village were gathering together. And you know what happens. The moms come to see what's going on. And they stand on the perimeter of the gathering, and they hear the stories too. And they begin to ask Jesus into their hearts, and their lives are transformed. And then before long, the men start to come. And they too accept Jesus. And almost everyone in this village comes to Christ. Our friends go to the village hearing of what is happening. And while talking to Tomby, he sees a man walking down the road with a regal stride. And he knows this is the chief of the village and I'm probably toast. Tomby saw the expression of worry upon the missionary's face, and she said, oh, don't worry, he is one of us. <laughs> he came and talked with the chief. Folks, because of people like you, they put up a tabernacle in that village. There's a pastor in that village. Trained in one of our Bible schools. And they dug a well on the property where they put the church so that the village would have water. The hard part was what Tomby did. To sow for a year without seeing any harvest. That was the hard part. Folks, the easy part is all the other stuff. The other stuff we can do. And to see missionaries go out from these churches. But I want to encourage you, see, that which had happened to her really turned around to serve, to advance the gospel of Christ. I'm almost done, but I want to show you a picture. This is a picture of a family in Burkina Faso. You may have prayed for this family. You may have prayed for their church because it was April 28th of 2019, not quite a year ago, that this family, and this is the pastor's daughter, the pastor's daughter of the Assembly of God Church in that village in Burkina Faso. This is the pastor's son-in-law, the pastor's grandkids. And see, Pastor Pierre had planted this church in 1984. And recently, extremists have been coming to him saying, you will leave this village. You will stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will leave. You will close the church and you will leave. He says, I will not. He said, you had better leave. He said, I will not. April 28, 2019, 12.30 in the afternoon in Burkina Faso, 12 guys on little motorbikes came onto the church property. They had weapons they said we told you to leave now you will convert to Islam or we will take your life this man the pastor's son-in-law was one of the ones on that day when said you will deny Christ or we will take your life he said I will not deny Christ and he is in the presence of Jesus today and then show the other picture, brother. This is a gathering of the church before this happened. 
the pastor and five men of this church were executed on the church property on that Sunday morning, not even a year ago, because they would not deny Christ. See, that which has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. The brothers and sisters are inspired to serve God with even greater fervency because they stood. They have inspired me. See, these people are my why. They're my why. It all works down to people just like these people. Everything we do with every missionary and every tabernacle that we build and every well that we drill, every Bible school that we plant, every leader that we train, it comes down to this, people in a place telling other people about Jesus. There's 87,000 pastors and ministers, assemblies of God, in the countries of Africa where we are. 50,000 of them have little or no training. And we got to do something about that, folks. But today I want to encourage you because, you see, that which has happened to Donna and I, that's how it ended up bringing us to the place that we would go on this great adventure to go to Africa. For Tombi, that which had happened to her really turned out to advance the gospel and see an entire village come to Christ. For Pastor Pierre and the people of his church, they are still undergoing great suffering and great trial and great persecution. But the gospel is advancing because of their faithfulness. And so, folks, I ask you today, what is in your hand? What's in your hand? Don't hold on to it and withhold it from God. If it's the pain of something that happened to you a long time ago or something that's happening to you right now, I can tell you that if you would be willing to lay it down before the Lord, that He will bring healing in your life. But more than that, He will craft paths in your life that you will come to know the faithfulness of God through that circumstance in a measure that you could not have known any other way. And folks, I want to tell you, I don't know what your gifts are. I don't know what your skills are. If you don't know what they are, you need to lay it before God and find out. Because if you'll lay it down before God. Wow. When we started this journey, God said, I'm going to do this through people and through ways that you did not anticipate. See? I thought, all, I thought that there would be several big churches that would just do a ton, you know. But God has worked this out. We started out with a rather large budget. We're 85% of the way there. This is happening. It's happening. Thank you for partnering with us, folks. It means so very much. There's the lady and adult teen challenge. Pledge $25 a month. The guy that came up to me, I'm quite certain that he has nothing in this world. He, in fact, told me, he said, I want to do something for you. He said, the biggest check I write every month is to Assemblies of God World Missions. I really thought it would be $10 a month. It was $100 a month. I get an email from him the other day saying, are you in Africa yet? I said, no, brother, we still got a ways to go. He said, well, I'm going to raise it to $200 a month. I said, God, I'm going to think about these people every time I spend a dime. He said, that's exactly what I want you to do. And we could go on and on with those stories. See, God uses people like you, like you, your skills and your gifts. But here's what I want to leave you with. We're going to Africa. Folks, Africa is important to the heart of God or we wouldn't be going. But across your street is just as important to the heart of God. And God has positioned you to lay down before him. You say, but I don't know what to do. I'm telling you what to do. Just lay it down. 
I don't know if he'll turn it into a snake or what. But just lay it down before him and let God do what he does. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we give this to you, Lord, we lay it out before you. And this is not about David and Donna being obedient going to Africa. This is about everybody in the house being obedient to the call of God in their lives. Folks, I'm prompted right now. If God's speaking to you about missions, you can talk to us afterwards. God's talking to you about going to Africa. He's talking to you about going somewhere in the world. Maybe today is the day that you open up and surrender to that. I feel prompted to tell you there's a man who was with a government agency. He retired. He took a job with a major corporation in the United States of America. He was the head over all security for the entire corporation. Hundreds and hundreds of stores. God spoke to him, called him to go help us plant a church in Durban, South Africa. He went in his 60s to help plant that church. God positioned him to be able to obey. I'll be 60 in April. Sometimes I think I'm getting too tired to go traipsing around a continent. But never once did God ask me how old I was. Whether you're young or you're old, let God speak to you this morning. Because he'll let you do incredible things that will advance the kingdom of God if you just lay it down before him and let him transform it. This morning, there's some of you who are still hurting because of that which has happened to you. We get that. It took us a while to heal up. And if you need healing this morning from that which has happened to you, I want to invite you as we begin to worship the Lord to come to this altar. You need healing for that which has happened to you. You're willing to lay it down before God and let him trade some beauty for some of those ashes, all of those ashes. He'll trade beauty. But this morning, you just need healing. And you're willing to lay it down and let God heal you this morning. We want to pray with you. There's others of you that God has invested stuff in your life and you don't even have the full understanding of what it is. But God's saying to you, I want you to lay down before me what's in your hand. And I want you to open yourself up to hear my voice and to see the wonders that only I can do. As we begin to worship the God, I want, I want you to come to this altar and let God begin to do a work in your heart and in your life. God has been saying some things that are really, really challenging to some of you. And you're afraid. You're afraid to open your hand up because you're afraid of what it will cost you. Folks, God never takes anything from us that he doesn't give us a whole ton of stuff that's worth a whole lot more. And today, you might not even understand the full import of it, but you're willing to come and stand and open your hands to God and worship God and say, here it is, God. As Sister Paula leads us in worship, perhaps we could just stand in this house. And if God's speaking to you, if you want prayer, come and stand and pastor and prayer team and leaders and Don and I will pray for you if you just want to get on your face before God then you come and you do that as we worship because God's talking to a lot of people today and we open it up to allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in our lives sister lead us in worship open up your hearts and worship to God Let this pass you by without jumping in, folks.
I want to pray prayer over you. Those that are praying, pay no mind to what I'm saying. The rest of us, just hold your hands out in front of you. I want you to think about in the one hand the stuff that's happened to you. In the other hand, I want you to think about the resources, the skills, the blessings. just to hold an open hand before God, not a closed fist, but an open hand before God to present it to Him. Lord, I pray for this people, Lord, each one of us, that as we open our hands up, this is what we're giving to You. We don't hold anything back, but we open our hands. Lord, we don't even know what that always means. But I pray, Lord, for those that stuff has happened in their lives and the difficulties and the hurt and the pain. Release them from the torment today. And, Lord, bring them into a place where you can do beautiful things in their lives. We trust you for it. God, we don't even need to escape it. We just need you to take it. No, God, we give to you. You are speaking to people, Lord, about ministry. You're speaking to people about sowing into the harvest field with stuff that you put in their lives. Some of them are thinking, God, that's not worth anything. But, Lord, I pray that you give them courage and boldness and strengthen them in their resolve to give it to you anyway to see what you're able to do. Your blessing and your anointing upon the people of God. In Jesus' name. Thank you.
your hands all across the house to Jesus. pray every person in this room today God that you will fulfill everything that you have purpose for their lives all the days of their life were written in your book before even one came to be you are the Lord of the story of our life circumstances situations abilities talents gifts have no bearing because you're the one who wrote the story. God, I pray you'll fulfill that story in every one of our lives. Yes, Lord. You'll fulfill, God, what we were purposed for. I pray, God, that you'll take those today who have felt like their abilities, their talents, and their gifts were not enough. I pray in the name of Jesus you will anoint every seed that's planted from their life. I pray, God, that you will use them in ways they cannot even begin to imagine. Lord, I pray today that the words that come from our life will not be compared to what the world says we ought to be. But the word that will come from our life would be faithful. That's all you're calling for us. Just to be faithful. Just to be faithful. Whether it's our five loaves and two fish, or whether it's a multitude. Just find us faithful, I pray. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will have boldness that is beyond anything you can understand. I pray that you will have boldness to step out in ways you never had before. I pray the boldness of God would begin to dwell up with inside of you like a mighty river. It will be more than you could ask or dare to imagine. I pray that God will give you words to speak that are not your own. He'll give you places to go that were not your plans. He will have purposes fulfilled in you that you never imagined would be. that in your life the kingdom of God will be fulfilled through you. The work of the kingdom fulfilled through you. That you will be his hands, you will be his feet, you will be his mouth. Whatever he needs from you, you will be. May his hand of grace guide you May His Holy Spirit empower you.
may he do more than you can ask or even imagine. Father, I pray you will fulfill your word to the lives of these, your people. And I pray you accomplish everything that you have purposed through every one of us. For all these things, a word together for the furthering of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we say, amen. So be it. In the name of the Lord. So be it. In the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We love each of you. We're so thankful to serve in the kingdom with you. I believe God is up to something. <laughs> Whew. More than you and I could ask or imagine. May he bless you. May he give you strength. May his joy always be the strength of your life. God bless you today. May he go with you. God bless. Have an incredible day in the Lord today. God bless you. Lord, I give you my heart. Give you my soul.
It's more than 